Take a Dutch community of the sort who defended themselves for 50 years against the entire force of Spain at a time when Spain was the foremost world power. Mix them with those intrepid French Huguenots who gave up their homes and possessions and left their country behind forever during the retraction of the Edict of Nantes. The product must inevitably be one of the hardiest, most vigorous and invincible races ever to be seen on earth. Take these formidable people and train them for seven generations in sustained warfare against savage men and wild beasts under conditions in which no weakling would even survive. Place them where they could acquire excellent skills with weapons and horsemanship. Give them a country that is exceptionally well suited to the tactics of the hunter and the sharpshooter and the horseman. Finally, add a finer temperament to their military characteristics by means of an unrelenting Old Testament religion and fiery and devouring patriotism. Combine all these qualities and all these incentives in one individual and you have the modern boor, the most formidable adversary ever to cross paths with the British Empire. Our military history mainly comprises conflicts with France, but Napoleon and all his veterans have never treated us as roughly as these determined farmers did with their religion and their alarmingly modern rifles. That's the author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 1902, right when the Anglo-Boer War was coming to an end. All right. Well, joining you today from a finally not sunny, nicely overcast day in Bloemfontein, South Africa, in the middle of the country. This is the capital of the Free State, that which was once called the Orange Free State. And we'll get into that, won't we? Yes, we will. I join you today from uh, the, what we call, at least in shorthand, the Women's Monument. The, which, win, which women monument to what? Well, okay, we'll get to that. Uh, let's back up. Have you heard of the Boer War? Or the Anglo Boer War of 19, what, 1889, 1899 to 1902 or so. It's okay if you haven't. A lot of us, uh, there's like maybe two or three hundred Americans that know anything about it, and uh, I'm not even in that rank yet. But uh, you remember how back in Cape Town, the story of Cape Town was that they were founded by. Uh, the Dutch East India Company to uh, to supply, you know, to set up farms and vineyards and uh, come up with fruits and vegetables and wine to supply their boats that were going around that tip of Africa to get to the East Indies, like in like Indonesia, what we call them today. And uh, this was before. This is the this is the middle 17th century. 1652 they got started there and of course that was long long before the 19th century with the building of the Suez Canal whereupon um, trade back and forth between Europe and the East uh, didn't need to go around Africa anymore but could go through the Red Sea. Anyways, okay so in these the, 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 there were plenty of Dutch who were interested in that there were some uh, kind of cantankerous uh, Puritan types who didn't feel like sticking around in the old country. And they were soon joined by some other interesting cantankerous personalities. Uh, the Huguenots, Huguenots of France who were getting chased out of France because they weren't Catholic or at least not Catholic enough. And also some Germans and some other types. And they, uh, they intermarried once they got here because there weren't that many of them, frankly. And the Afrikaner, which is just African, 
in the Dutch language uh, was born, you know, as a national identity themselves. Okay, well that was going all right, but uh, Her Majesty figured it out that, uh, that she wanted the Cape Town and the Cape Colony, and that it wasn't too hard for them to take over there, down in that, it's, it's kind of like a, it's the southwest corner of uh, what we think of today as South Africa. All right, and these, these Boers slash Afrikaners, by the way, Boer just means farmer in the Afrikaner language, which ended up being a language unto itself, though closely related to what we today call Dutch. Uh, Boer just means farmer, but it took on kind of extra meaning, kind of like cowboy to you and me. And, uh, they didn't want to live under British rule. And so in 1838 was the Voor Trek, the Long Trek. And that was these Afrikaner types uh, talking about covered wagons and the whole thing, sound familiar? Of uh, setting out into the interior of what we now call South Africa, not to grow vegetables so much anymore, but grains and lots of cattle and lots of sheep. So a different kind of life for sure. And that was going all right. Uh, right around the end of the 19th century, there was some kind of showdown uh, between the Afrikaners and the British. And uh, it didn't involve a cast of thousands, but there, it was an armed conflict, an armed struggle. And the, and the, the Afrikaners won. And thereby was formed the two or republics. One was called the Orange Free State, which is now a province of South Africa today, just called Free State. And then there was also the Transvaal Republic, Transvaal across the Vaal River, V-A-A-L. You can find that on Google Maps too. And that was uh, north and east of the Orange Free State and contained uh, what, is, what we now think of as, uh, what we now know as Pretoria and Johannesburg. All right. Okay, that went on for a while. Not super long, because they found, well, for one, they found those diamonds over in Kimberley. And they also found all that gold over in the Transvaal Republic in what is now Johannesburg. And so uh, Her Majesty was at it again. Okay. Uh, there was some sort of contention. There was some negotiations that didn't work out. And the, uh, the Anglo-Boer War was on right around 1899 or 1900. And uh, it was a guerrilla war. Perhaps this sounds familiar to you. You've got the locals who are, a, I mean, a very tough and cantankerous bunch of people. And uh, you'll, you'll notice in some of the pictures, if I get some of my pictures from inside the museum, which I wasn't supposed to take, if I get them into the video, you'll see they didn't have common outfits. They didn't have common uniforms. Some had no uniforms at all. It was really, um, they, they had organization, but not like all the insignia and stuff. There was a lot of ambush warfare, guerrilla warfare, shooting cannons at... English encampments down in the valleys below and in the towns. Uh, the Boers were always uh, outnumbered, like 10 to 1 or so, but they knew their way around. They knew how to function in the land, and frankly, they cared more. And so they were always getting the best of these British. And so, oh, by the way, also, this was the first big conflict that the British were involved in that was in a time of widespread photography in newspapers and pictures in newspapers. And so people were watching and people were going to see a defeat if it ended in that way. And they were going to see the details of it. And so uh, the British turned up the heat and started fighting these Boers in a more uh, more more civilizational scale, a more total war kind of scale. And so 
instead of just running around and chasing after the uh, the commandos, which is another word for malicious, they got more serious about it and uh, then began uh, the slash and burn policy of burning down the farms and killing the livestock and taking the uh, women and children prisoner into what we today call concentration camps. In the, for one thing, this, you know, the burning of the farms and uh, livestock and everything, you were taking calorific value out of the country, right? Because the English, they were supplied from the Cape Colony far away via rail. And so they had their provisions from elsewhere, whereas the Boer needed to grow their own provisioning and burning up and destroying these farms just just uh, took the spoon right out of their mouths, you know? And also taking the, the women and the kids you know, hostage in that way, but also for their own good, you know, you see, uh, that, that was also humiliating. Not only was that humiliating, but now that you have the women and kids in these camps, you can, you can use incompetence, you can use the fact that this is a war when we're out of supplies, you can use, there's all kinds of ways you can kind of passive-aggressively uh, do away with these people. But it's always behind like a bureaucratic decision one at a time. You know what I mean? So there were about 25,000 uh, deaths in these camps and uh, almost entirely uh, moms and grandmas and kids. And that, that was even more humiliating for these guys. And so... Uh, let me, let me show you, uh, like they're like the phases and the stages of this process that, uh, that were set up in, in the forms of statues and monuments out here. And uh, you'll notice that there's, there's no English in any of the plaques or anything because, of course, the English, at least by these people, were certainly seen as the, uh, the villains and the aggressors. In this experience and so and they set up this place for each other and so you'll notice there's no English out here I, I could look up some words on my Google Translate so I can learn a little bit about things uh, but it's not really for us it's really for them okay here we go off skate off skate I don't know how to say it correctly but I can use Google Translate to translate it to departure so middle October 1899 and here's here's dad with his rifle and no particular outfit right but his, his rifle and his stuff and there he is and he is saying goodbye to mom over here With baby, of course. Departure. And here's the headliner here. Never mind the Masonic territory marking. Or, you know, make a big deal of it if you're into that. Let's get up a little closer. My Google Translate Afrikaans is not perfect, but uh, I make it out to be there. You know, the big words at the top there in the middle. An onze hildinen, an lieve kinderen, to our heroines 
and beloved children. Uvil Gishaibi, your will be done. Here. Now begiven and verlaten, the two the two nouns there. Uh, both come off as leave and leave on Google Translate. But it's got it can't that can't quite be right. But uh Excel you need begiven, Excel you need verlaten, I think comes across as uh I will not abandon you or forsake you. This is straight out of the Bible, of course. And you'll see that the, the camps were uh, almost all tents. Tents out in the middle of nowhere. I don't even think they put you know, fencing or anything around there because uh, why? Uh, they, they were so uh, in such need of what little bit of supply they were provided. Uh, where were they going to go and they couldn't get enough? I can't imagine they could get enough resources together to actually go anywhere else even if they wanted to. Okay. Here they are, must be on their way. On their way in or on their way out at the end, I don't know. For Freiheit Volk und Vaterland, for freedom, people, and fatherland. There they are. Die Benneling, the exile. So this was for, uh, how you say, prisoners of war or those who might become prisoners of war if they had the chance, if you know what I mean. And they didn't go to camps in the country. They went to POW camps in other places in the empire, like, like in India and Sri Lanka and Bermuda in a, a little island called St. Henla I'd never heard of. You can tell they're on a ship. I mean, this railing is pretty conspicuously on some sort of vehicle. And uh, notice how, notice how their, their clothes are being blown upwards. The little guy's jacket and the elder fellow's jacket blown upwards. This must be the bow of a ship. The Beneling, the exile. Die Bitterinder, 31st of May, 1902, The Bitter Ender. So here's Dad. Here's Dad on his way back. Bitter Ender, meaning the fellows who, who served uh, for all three years of this. Look how tired his horse is. Look how skinny his horse is. Look how tired and skinny he is. Uh, the the guns and piles here, of course, represent the disarmament, which was part of the uh, the treaty deal that the what the best the generals could do in their deal with the British. And there's a whole lot of story out there about just what just what exactly happened. There were Many feel that there was a betrayal there, that some various generals got bought out or sold out or felt they had to make some kind of compromise. I don't know enough about it. This is the bitter ender. Also, kind of conspicuously, it's the one statue here that 
It has an electric fence around it. It's kind of sad. And there's the city of Bloemfontein. And there's the Women's Monument over there where we just were. Oh yeah, just a little bit of Captain Obvious for you here in case you missed it. You'll notice that uh, Dad here, the Bitterender, is coming back by himself. Because Mom and the Baby are memorialized as having passed in the camp over there. Right, so now they're separated by this distance here. And then on this little mall here, between the monument and the visitor center that was clearly built afterwards, we have these little plaques. See them? And these must be for like the headlining uh, camps that had names and locations. They were along railways. Here's, yeah, I can't pronounce. Uh, Afrikaans well yet. Mafeking, Mafeking, I don't know. But you see that, uh, you, you can figure it out, right? This one, the best records they had anyway. Here we have Kinder, 15 and younger, kids 15 and under. 683 people, people, you know, persona, our as 15, the grown ups, 145, total 828. And then, Oh, not very good records on that one. Here we have another one. So it wasn't just one. If I, I know I used the, the term camp uh, absentmindedly just a few minutes before. But you'll see there's a bunch of these. And uh, as the records go, the best they have, it was about 20, 25,000 people perished in all. And there's more here on the other side. And over here, let's go over here, there's this new, see over there? Definitely taken off of the, like the Vietnam Monument. Over there we have uh, individual names. This was all added in the, uh, in 2014. So they had a little bit more money together. And also we have, you know, some uh, new South Africa kind of talky talk and they're making a thing, honestly, an honest thing about how it wasn't just it wasn't just Afrikaner whites either. Uh, there were plenty, the Afrikaner have been joined at the hip with colored, that's the term actually, colored and, and native labor families pretty much since the day they got here. And a lot of, a lot of them got rounded up also. They were, um, they made a point uh, about this being a white man's war. That is to say they would not arm the, uh, the Afrikaner or the natives, but they were definitely, uh, there was plenty of uh, common affinity there and uh, a lot of uh, colored families and also including, and just, yeah, families who like live nearby or who were household servants, uh, they, got, they got bundled up into these camps also. And, uh, and of course there's a new wing in, in the visitor center that's about that subject. And, as far as I can tell, honestly done. And so we can get, uh, here they really got busy. Clearly, uh, you can tell that, you know, mechanized, sorry about all the, the techno speak, but mechanized engraving was uh, part of the story here that they could do in the early 21st century. They couldn't do a century before when they set up the other stuff. Let's go to, just because it's a name that we've heard, Let's go to the De Beers section. Remember how the De Beers family was the first claim owner in the Kimberly Diamond Mine? That's not, they weren't the only De Beerses around here because, oh, back here. Doo, 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 doo. Here we go. 
Yeah, see? De beer, de beer, de beer, de beer, de beer. Now, I don't know what VFM means. I don't know what that means. I know M means male and F means female. So you'll, see, you'll notice here that uh, most of the male names, Jacobus, Francis, Charles, uh, Gerhardus, Johannes, less than a year old, less fractional years old. And then, you know, more kids in the De Beers section, I guess for one name, they had to sort them by something else. Yeah, I guess that's what it was. They sorted them upwards by age until you get to, uh, for, okay, I can't, I can't fully understand this, but, to, oh, look at that, three days. Where's my finger? Hang on, sorry. Yeah, little Albertus. Hmm, got listed twice. Can't tell you why. Three days, three days. Little Jan here, 14 days. So there's a lot of kids here. But not just kids. For example, here's, uh, look for the, the, the women's names. There's Barbara. She was 18. Another Barbara, 52. Here's Grandma Gertina. She was 72. Oh, look at that. Here's Martha, 29, and clearly her baby, little Martha, uh, a month. And like that. Agtarayer, which translates to squire. So you can tell this statue from the plinth here was added later uh, in honor of our colored buddy here, who, <laughs> he doesn't have a rifle on him, but he does have his own ammunition. So, hmm, it's conspicuous. Yes, I built in 2015, this one. Just a little bit of technology, the block house. So the Boers were all about um, sabotage and uh, busting up bridges and uh, rail lines and stuff, at least the ones that they couldn't use themselves. And that became necessary to set up these little baby forts all over the place uh, for the British to do that. Also, uh, what, Craig? Well, also, you know, the, the slash and burn policy, uh, you know, tactic required the physical processing of an area that's similar to what, Arizona or something? I mean, this is a big area and it was, it was a very expensive big thing to do just to get enough guys to every one of these houses just to blow it up and burn it down and kill all the animals. Like this was a real, this was a big operation. And also uh, part of this blockhouse system was the erection of uh, barbed wire systems all over the place in an attempt to just slow down and restrict the boar's movements. Uh, yeah, of course, you know, we all know what wire cutters are, but a lot of these guys didn't have wire cutters. And so it got a lot, it, it got hard to, uh, to get fenced in that way. And it was just another way to, I mean, outspend the hell out of uh, the competition and also use more, I don't, don't want to say uh, industrial or uh, uh, material means of uh, taking away their ability and their, their will to fight uh, as an alternative to uh, finding them and meeting them head up on the battlefield because frankly meeting them head up on the battlefield wasn't even possible. They were guerrilla fighters. Also in terms of technology the Boers invented trenches. This is something that they would do uh, when they were heading off or uh, ambushing uh, uh, British on their way through someplace, 
is they invented trenches as a way of being able to shoot at somebody without being shot back at. So this was, <laughs> this was a big deal. This wasn't just some guys running around and shooting each other over their shoulder. I mean, this was, uh, this was a, a real civilizational kind of struggle. And clearly we learned a whole lot from this uh, to inform World War I, which was only, what, 12 years later. Oh yeah, and last little quickie, Afskade, Afskade, that's not departure, it's farewell, farewell, right, 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 so farewell mom and dad, and farewell women's monument, farewell remembrance garden, and farewell visitor center, which is a really neat place in there. I mean, you give them, you give them your buck and a half to get in, and they've got all kinds of really well done, nicely done. I mean, it, it, it's impressive in there. You will not be disappointed. Also, <laughs> uncharacteristic for this dry part of the world, but uh, that would be rain coming this way very blatantly. And I'm, uh, it's getting dark, and I'm wearing sandals with socks. So, time for me to find my way out of here and later. Boy, look at that. Here's a dramatic shot for you. Let's give it 10 more seconds. You might catch some more lightning. Or not. <laughs>